Hello and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. Um, words cannot describe on how I wish we were all here in this building together. Uh, this building has been um, empty for too long and it's just getting, getting kind of lonesome. But praise be to God that we have this technology that we can get together and... Um, we can uh, study God's Word in that aspect, and uh, we have ways to do things. And, and I, tell you, I tell you this, um, it gives us a new perspective in life as far as Bible study and, and Christianity and, and uh, fellowship and all these things. Uh, I don't know about you, but I certainly do appreciate or will appreciate even more so when this is all said and done, and hopefully and prayerfully that will be uh, said and done real soon. Uh, those of you who are used to sitting in the back, uh, let me formally apologize to you. You get to be this close to me, so uh, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. But anyway, we're going to continue in our study in Philemon for this evening, and this may or may not be the last uh, lesson in this book. I've thoroughly enjoyed studying this book myself and also studying this book with you. And of course, as always, um, these lessons that uh, we've been sharing for the last couple of weeks derive from uh, the lessons that Cliff Goodwin gave at Polishing the Pulpit a couple of years ago. Probably the best study I've ever had uh, with uh, with someone on a certain on a certain book, and I'm certainly glad that uh, um, that uh, I'm allowed to do this with you. Um, just as a recap, we've talked about Christian encouragement, or the there's different topics in this book. Uh, Christian encouragement, uh, where um, uh, Paul is going to encourage Philemon. Uh, to take in Onesimus, his runaway slave. And, uh, and he also brings about some examples that how Philemon was encouraging uh, to other brethren. And so Paul is asking Philemon to encourage me. It will give me encouragement if you take in Onesimus into your home. Also, uh, Christian love. Uh, agape love, love in spite. God loves us in spite of our shortcomings. Uh, Philemon had love and has shown his love to all saints. And uh, of course, Onesimus did him wrong, but he's encouraged to have that same agape love toward his new brother. Uh, Christian persuasion, same along the same lines, Paul is persuading Philemon to take in Onesimus. And that, in fact, you and I as Christians need to be um, uh, more interested in this kind of thing because we are, uh, we are here to persuade people to act according to God's Word, which at times is contrary to their human impulse. With Philemon having this possible ill will toward Onesimus because of the sin that he has committed, perhaps... Uh, uh, he needed to be persuaded uh, to do something that's godly, which is against his human impulse. Christian Revolution did an in-depth study of, uh, of uh, Christians, or not Christian slavery, but uh, um, biblical slavery and what that really meant and uh, that the, sla the slavery that you and I know of that's related to our nation's history is condemned in the scriptures and not uh, promoted. In fact, uh, this, uh, there's a revolution toward this and to where we're all free from bondage and that at the cross we're on the same level. In uh, Christian transformation, we're transformed from, uh, uh, the, uh, from darkness into the light. We are transformed uh, to godly living. We're transformed into the kingdom. And now that Onesimus is in the kingdom, Philemon needed to um, uh, also have a transformation perhaps himself. Now, today our topic is Christian reconciliation. Christian reconciliation. And we did um, uh, touch on this 
a little bit last week, but as a way of recapping, we're going to uh, touch on it again as far as the introduction. We just did a little bit of the introduction last week because of time, but now we have time to go through it. Hopefully, we'll get through this lesson within um, this study time. Okay, biblical recon reconciliation. We know that restoration is, uh, well, biblical reconciliation is restoring oneself to God's divine favor. When man is reconciled unto God, he is restored to good standing with God. And that's where we want to be. Uh, fellowship has been restored between the cre creator and the created or the creature. Uh, some English versions have reconciliation as an atonement. And, uh, and by that, it suggests that our reconciliation is affected by the paying of a price. Let's ask ourselves this. Why is there a reconciliation that is needed? Why do we need to be reconciled unto God? Well, first of all, it will be because of wickedness and sin. If you have your Bibles with you, let's go to uh, together the book of Colossians and read with me chapter 1 and verse 21. And you that were sometime alienated, now remember that word alienated or alienation is the opposite of reconciliation. You were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind. How? This is why we need reconciliation. By wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. We are uh, alienated by wicked works, and because we are alienated and because of those wicked works that we have done, we've been alienated, there's a reconciliation that is necessary. I want, you, I want us to look at another um, verse, and that is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In verse 19, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19, where Paul says, To wit, to know, it's now in our knowledge, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their, now look at that word, what's it say? Trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of what? Reconciliation. So we've been alienated, we've been separated uh, from God because of wicked works, because of our trespasses, and because we are alienated or separated from God, a reconciliation is needed. We need reconciliation. So we also need to ask this. What has accomplished this great spiritual feat? What has accomplished this reconciliation? Well, let's go to Romans chapter 5, and let's read verses uh, f uh, 10 and 11. Romans chapter 5, 10 and 11. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, here's how, number one, how this reconciliation is accomplished. By the death of His Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. We are reconciled unto God by the death of His Son. But did you notice also we are saved by His life? Have you ever realized that? The death would mean absolutely nothing if the way He lived wasn't according or uh, to God's will if it wasn't satisfying. His death would not satisfy God if Jesus would, did not live the perfect life. He lived life perfectly. And now even today we're saved by His life because He is alive. He is alive today. And right now, as we are standing here or sitting here studying our Bibles, He's making intercession for us. So how we live according to His will, Jesus is making intercession for us. Us. That is truly amazing. So number one, we are uh, reconciled unto God by the death of His Son. Number two, let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 16. Ephesians 2, verse 16. 
and that he might reconcile, there's that word again, both unto God in one body, how? Here's the tool. Here's the tool. By the cross. By the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. The cross was the instrument used to put his son to death. We are reconciled unto God by the death of his son and by the cross. Okay? Now also, number three, we are reconciled unto God uh, through the blood. Let's go to Colossians again. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth, or things in heaven. We are reconciled unto God by the death of His Son with the instrument that was used to kill His Son, the cross, where He bled. We're reconciled unto God by the blood. We're reconciled unto God by the blood. Now, take that thought. And let's go to John chapter 19 and read these two verses together. John 19, uh, verses 33 and 34. But when they came to Jesus, he was already gone and saw that he was dead already. They break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and what came out? Blood and water. Have that thought in your mind for one second. Blood and water. I'm, I've been told countless times, especially at the School of Preaching, that we must pay attention to details, okay? I, there has to be something to it when we see that there came out of him blood and water. Well, how do we contact the blood today? Obviously, there's not a, uh, uh, there, we, we can't, literally apply it to our bodies and cleanse the sins away that's not possible but we're told how we can come in contact with the blood of his son that is if we are immersed into water Romans 6 3 and 4 we are baptized into his death so that's important that's why biblical reconciliation is needed we've been separated from God because of our wicked works, because of our trespasses, and we can be reconciled unto God because of the death of His Son and by the cross through the blood. And through those things, we are reconciled unto God. Now, let's go back to Philemon. That's a, a little bit of an introduction about reconciliation. And we're going to put all this together, okay? Put all this together. We're going to look at three different relationships of reconciliation and all three are related all three are related you're really going to enjoy the connection here as much i hope you will as much as i did when when i was listening to this study first we're going to look at the reconciliation in between paul and john mark paul and john mark now i want you to look at philemon and look at verse uh 24 and look at the very first name that we have here. We're in the book of Philemon. This is our study. Look at the first name in verse 24. What do you see? You see Marcus. That's the same man. Marcus. Um, as a matter of fact, if we read the whole verse there, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. If you notice, two of those men are the writers of, the, of two of the gospel accounts. And so that's very interesting to me. Um, but Mark was kind, was not kind, kin. He was kin to Barnabas. Mark was a relative to Barnabas, who is the son of encouragement. Uh, I want you to go to uh, Colossians chapter 4 real quick. Look at verse 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, salutes you, and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas. So Marcus and Barnabas were related. Were they, some say that he was a nephew. Some say that he was a cousin. I, I don't really know for sure. 
if, if he's sister's son to Barnabas, uh, maybe nephew, I'm not sure, um, kind of irrelevant. But uh, we do know that he was related to Barnabas. But we keep on reading. Touching whom you received commandments, if you come, if he come unto you, look what Paul tells him to do. Receive him. Now, we have to realize that instruction may have been necessary because of the history between Mark and Paul. You ever, you ever thought about that? Well, let's go to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, and let's read verses 36 through 40. 15, Acts chapter 15, 36 through 40. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with him John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them with, from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed being, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So earlier, Paul was not willing to take Mark. Barnabas gave Mark a second chance, but Paul was not ready. He did not trust Mark. Mark had abandoned him. From the work. So, yeah, the, the history is not good between Paul and Mark. So, why am I even saying this? Because if we go back, you know, to Colossians 4 and 10, he's going to tell him, Receive Mark, he is profitable. Well, Paul could not have told Philemon to take in Onesimus or reconcile with Onesimus if Paul never reconciled with Mark, right? It's like, hello, pot, my name is Kettle, all right? It's, it's, it would be hypocritical, if you will. So Paul, is, he calls on Philemon to reconcile with Onesimus. And so it is, he, he knows what that means. He knows what reconciliation means. Paul is practicing what he was preaching. Incidentally, that's being a follower of Christ. We practice what we preach. We practice or live by what we believe in, right? What we know in the scriptures. That's exactly the follower of Jesus. In Acts chapter 1 verse 1, the, uh, Luke says, The former truth is, have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Okay, so Jesus did what he taught. So, right here, going to back to Philemon, look at verse 11. Which in time past was the unprofitable, now profitable to thee and to me. Okay, he's profitable now. Uh, so, he's trying to tell Philemon, he is profitable. You can reconcile. I can vouch for Onesimus. I can also tell you to reconcile or suggest to you to reconcile because I also went through the same thing. Paul was practicing what he preached. Now in verse 11 here, which is uh, in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. That word profitable there is only in the New Testament two other times. And we're going to go there. We're going to go to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verses, uh, verse 11. Now look. Look who he's talking about. Only Luke is with me. Take who? Mark. Take Mark and bring him with thee. Why? For he is, there's that same word that we see in verse 11 in Philemon. He is profitable to me for the ministry. There must have been some reconciliation here. Same word he's using. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet. Okay, meet, that's the word, same word as profitable from the other two verses, for the master's use. Okay, 
Mark, who at one time abandoned Paul, has now been reconciled unto Paul. He must have been penitent, and not only so, he went above and beyond. He is now profitable for the ministry. He is now meat for the master's youth, uh, use. And that is the beauty of Christian reconciliation. So Paul had an opportunity to talk with uh, uh, to Philemon because of his own experience. Now we'll go back to the reconciliation between Philemon and Onesimus. Here's the plot of the entire book here. We have to understand that in this book, there is a third person involved. When we think of Philemon, we study Philemon, we think Philemon is the recipient of the letter and it's about him receiving Onesimus, his runaway slave. That's two people. But there's one more person involved. Uh, Philemon is the namesake. Onesimus is the subject matter. But Paul, the apostle, makes the great appeal. He's the third person who is involved. Now, uh, according to the study that, uh, that uh, well, um, <laughs> Cliff, he said this in his, in his lesson. There is a subtlety of Roman law here. If a slave was caught, owner had a right to disfigure, lame, or kill that slave. However, there's one little subtlety of law here. The slave was conceded to one right. He could make an appeal to his master's friend. Okay? We didn't talk about this yet. All right? We, the, the master had a right to kill his slave, runaway slave. But the slave had one right. He, he had a right to make an appeal to his master's friend to whom he could flee, not for concealment, okay, but for advocacy. He's looking for an advocate. This is more likely if the friend was a partner of the slave owner. Okay, it couldn't just be any old buddy buddy acquaintance. This it is more likely that the slave can go to the partner of the slave owner. If the slave ran to the partner, that slave didn't incur the same guilt or penalty as an escaped slave. Now, all of these roles are filled in Philemon. Why is it that in a letter that concerns two men, a third member involved is prominent? It's because of this. Paul is the intercessor. Okay? Paul is the intercessor. Look at verse 17. If thou count me therefore a what? Partner, receive him as myself. Had Onesimus already wronged his master? Well, we assume that, that the wrong was done when he fled and possibly stole from his master to finance his journey. And, and if that's the case, why end up with the Apostle Paul? Could it be possible that Onesimus had wronged Philemon in some other way? We don't know. But because of that first wrong, Onesimus had to flee, maybe. And he wanted to seek intercession so what did he do he ran to paul possibly how they come together now there's some views remember we talked about this before that uh, onesimus was arrested and then that he w was sent to prison and then they met paul in prison but paul was not in a normal prison he was under house arrest uh, another view is that epaphras saw onesimus and persuaded him to see paul epaphras saw onesimus said man your life is a wreck let me introduce you to paul Okay, and then straighten your life out, possibly. I don't know. But now, come to think of it, this third view is more likely. Onesimus left looking for Paul, knowing that Paul was, was the only one that could plead his case. Paul went to bat for Onesimus. He was interceding for Onesimus. Look at verse 10. I beseech thee for my son, Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Verse 19, I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it, albeit 
I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thy own self besides. <laughs> you know, he, Paul here was willing to suffer financially if that was necessary. Uh, demonstrating a loving concern for one who could face death. That's what Paul was doing. Now, that brings us to our third point. That's what brings us all together. This what is what makes Philemon so exciting and so amazing is that notice the similarities how Paul is interceding for Onesimus and how Jesus intercedes for you and me. This is amazing. Okay, Time may go a little bit long, but I, I, I guarantee you it's worth it. But perhaps uh, I'm almost done. Just bear with me. Perhaps we have Philemon as an illustration. An illustration for how Jesus gives us reconciliation with God. Onesimus is Philemon's property. You and I are God's property. Let's look at Psalm uh, Psalm 100, verse 3. Psalm 100, verse 3. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people, possession, and the sheep of His pasture. Because of our wrongdoings, We've been alienated from our master, just like Onesimus, his wrongdoings alienated him from his own master. Remember Colossians 1 and 21? Let's read that one more time. Colossians 1 and 21. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled? So that's, that, that's one illustration. Onesimus is Philemon's property. We are God's property. Here's another illustration. The only means of reconciliation with God is through his co-equal, his partner, and that would be Christ. What do I mean by that? Well, let's read some more scripture. Let's go to John chapter 10, John chapter 10, verse 30. John chapter 10, verse 30. I and my Father are... One, we are co-equal. John 5 and uh, 19. John 5 and 19. Let's read that. Let's see if I'm... No, I'm sorry, verse 17. But Jesus answered them, My Father works hitherto, and I work. That's partnership. Okay, they are co-equal, and they are partners. Remember, remember that subtlety, that Roman law. That could be helpful to a slave if the intercessor had been a partner to the master. Jesus Christ is our only recourse. He has stepped in as the mediator. He offered the price of His blood. And as the risen Savior, He intercedes or pleads on our behalf before the master. Isn't that something? Paul stepped in uh, just as Jesus did. Uh, let's read uh, 1 Timothy 2 and 5. 1 Timothy 2 and 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So Paul stepped in. He's the one mediator between Onesimus and Philemon. Jesus is the one mediator between us and God. In verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Jesus paid the price. Paul was willing to pay the price. Go to 1 Peter 1 and 19. 1 Peter 1 and 19 here. Here's the price. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So it brings the question, what is Jesus doing now? Well, let's read Romans 8 and 34 together. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Notice some things here. 
Christ died. He's the one that paid the penalty. Which, again, it says that is risen again, which proves that God accepted that sacrifice. Uh, it proves the significance of the resurrection. If, if God did not accept uh, the sacrifice from His Son, then He surely wouldn't have been risen again. Not at all. But He's also at the right hand of God, and what's He doing? He's making intercession for you and me. Jesus has the Father's ear pleading my case. I don't deserve that. Paul was making an appeal from friend to friend. Onesimus really didn't deserve it. But this right here, this book, Philemon, is Christianity Applied. Applied Christianity. We have Christian encouragement, Christian agape love, Christian persuasion, persuading people uh, to go against our human impulses and do that what is right according to God's word. Christian revolution, transformation, and reconciliation. The faith we possess is not intended to be theory in our hearts or minds. The faith is not just for discussion. In this book of Philemon, we have Christianity as where rubber meets the road, I guess you would say. A real circumstance, an illustration. And it's time for Christian principles to be applied. So, that concludes our study of Philemon. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it has brought some thoughts to your mind. I hope it's helped you grow in your faith. And uh, it truly has mine. And, and I hope you'll look at it again. Just read it over and over again and notice these different things. Uh, thank you so much for uh, being with me tonight as we uh, uh, studied uh, our Bibles this evening. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you so much for your wisdom, your grace, your mercy, your love, your encouragement, your persuasion, Father. We have all motivation that is needed to go to you at all times, at all circumstances, Father. You are the only one that we could go to. And we're so grateful for that. We're grateful for this avenue of prayer. We're grateful for the way of salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ, who did pay the price for me, who did rise again, which proves that you have accepted that price and that he is now interceding for me and for, for all of us. Father, may people who are not Christians, they be convicted in their hearts to follow your way. It is the best way. It's the only way of escape. Father, be with Fairview. Continue to be with her elders and her deacons. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.